Today, we're gonna to start a series of two lectures on electrochemical reactors. And electrochemical engineering is my primary area of expertise. And I thought it would be a missed opportunity for us not to talk about them, particularly as electrochemical reactions and electrochemical systems are becoming increasingly industrially important. And that leads to a very obvious question because it's unlikely that many of you have had exposure to them in the past. What is an electrochemical system? And what is electrochemical engineering? Well, hopefully this lecture can help to clarify some of that. And then we'll do a little bit more specifics related to kinetics in the next lecture in this series. And electrochemical engineering is very similar in definition to chemical engineering, which is why many chemical engineers become electrochemical engineers or why a lot of electrochemical engineers are chemical engineers. And electrochemical engineering is really the application of electrochemistry, math, thermokinetics and transport. And we do that in such a way to design products that benefit society. And then if we're able to do that, we also use economics to then scale up and manufacture those products in the hope that we might be able to do something, whether it's to create an industrially relevant product, right? Some feedstock for another process, whether it is to generate clean energy, et cetera. There are a number of things that we can do to create and store energy using electrochemical devices or to use electrical energy to facilitate chemical transformations. And that's something we'll talk a little bit more about as we move along. Now, of course, this begs another question of what is electrochemistry to dig down deeper? Well, electrochemistry is a subset of physical chemistry that's focused on electron transfer processes, right? Or redox reactions is probably what you refer to them as in general chemistry. And those reactions occur at the interface between an electrically conducting substrate or what we usually call an electrode and an ionically conducting electrolyte. And that interface is something that's very important in electrochemical systems. And we'll talk about it a couple more times during this series of lectures. But the important thing here about electrochemical processes is that they provide and facilitate direct transformation between chemical energy and electrical energy. And this is a lot different from the things that many of you have done in the past. For example, in thermal one, where to get from chemical energy to usable energy, there's also or often an intermediate, which is thermal. So you have some reaction that creates thermal energy, then that thermal energy is transferred into mechanical energy and thermochemical cycles because of that are intrinsically limited to fairly low overall efficiencies between 30 and 40%. And that would be exactly what we get. Let's say you took hydrogen and designed a power generation cycle around hydrogen combustion, even if that hydrogen was renewably generated, you would get 30 to 40% efficiency for that cycle. If you took an electrochemical system or a fuel cell, and we'll talk more about fuel cells later, to do the exact same thing, you would be able to do so at 70 to 80% efficiency. And so electrochemical systems can help us to improve efficiency. Now, that leads us to an interesting question that we asked even at the very beginning of the semester. Are all reactions then redox reactions? Well, the answer, quite frankly, is no. There's acid-based neutralizations. There's precipitation reactions. Those are not redox reactions. But as a chemical engineer, up until now, you've focused mostly on taking raw materials and using chemical transformations to create new molecules. Now that act, the creation of new molecules, inevitably relies on electron transfer and the, the transformation to usable molecules, especially. And one of the examples that we use at the very beginning of the semester is methane combustion. Methane plus two oxygens give us CO2 plus two waters, right? And that's balance. And if you remember in our very first lecture, we looked at this, right? And we said, well, how do we know that a redox reaction has happened here? Well, the oxidation state for carbon there is four and the oxidation state for that for carbon there is plus four, right? So we've had essentially an eight electron change in the oxidation state of carbon in that case. And when we looked at that, we then looked at 
writing the redox reaction for methane. And we did that. And we did this in the aqueous phase. We said that, well, you could have methane plus two water molecules give us CO2 plus eight protons plus eight electrons, right? And we wrote it that way. And then we asked ourselves, what about oxygen? And if you remember, oxygen on this side of the equation has an oxidation state of zero and here has an oxidation state of minus two. And somewhere oxygen was reduced and we wrote a reaction for the reduction of oxygen and oxygen plus four protons plus four electrons could give us two water molecules, okay? And actually, if we looked at this and just multiplied that equation by two, you would get two oxygens plus four, uh, sorry, plus eight protons, plus eight electrons gives us four water molecules, okay? And if we wanted to balance this equation, right? Well, we could, and you could say that, all right, well, those cancel, those cancel. Um, this becomes a two and cancels with that. And we end up with the overall reaction of methane plus oxygen gives us CO2 plus two waters, right? That's the exact same reaction that's there, except we've, we've decoupled the oxidation and the reduction reaction. But that's where we stopped in our first lecture. We didn't then ask ourselves, well, how would we build a device that could actually do this? And so let's think about that for a second. Well, we would need something that could move electrons around. And so our surface in all of our electrochemical reactions are solids that are electrically conducting. Now there is photoelectrochemistry where it only becomes conducting under exposure to light, but we won't talk about photochemistry. So we'll, we'll focus here on how do we enable sort of a traditional electrochemical approach that, that relies on substrates or electrodes that are always conductive. Well, in an electrochemical system then, you, you need electrodes and there are two of them. Okay, so there's the anode and there's the cathode. And quite often, the cathode electrode is considered to be the positive electrode and the anode is called the negative electrode. And at the anode, that's where the oxidation reaction occurs. And the cathode is where the reduction reaction occurs. And so in this case, our oxidation reaction is the oxidation of methane, right? Which we already wrote, right? CH4 plus two waters gives us CO2 plus eight protons plus eight electrons. And the reduction happens on the cathode. And that was oxygen plus four protons plus four electrons gives us two water molecules, okay? And those are the redox processes that are happening. But we haven't actually created a circuit yet, right? How do the electrons get from one electrode to the other? And that is through an external circuit. Okay, and there really are two types of electrochemical reactors. One that is spontaneous. And we call those galvanic. And the nice thing about galvanic reactors is that they usually generate power. That's really what we use them for most of the time. And we also then have non-spontaneous, where we have to force the reaction to happen, and those are called electrolytic. And you may have even heard of like electrolyzers, 
And that's just a word for the, a type of device where we apply a voltage and we'll get into voltage a little bit later um, to do something, right? To enable some chemical transformation, okay? So our electrochemical reactor then has two electrodes, right? An anode and a cathode where an oxidation and reduction happen respectively. And we have an external circuit. But if you see what's happening in this cartoon that I'm drawing, we have positive charges that are only moving in that direction, or sorry, negative charges moving in that direction. And you would think then that you would be accumulating charge at the cathode. And that's not allowed. So in most systems, we have to maintain charge neutrality. And the way that we do this in an electrochemical reactor is that we introduce an electrolyte. Now I'm drawing it here as if it were a liquid with the blue squigglies being water, right? But that's not necessarily the case. There are, there are solid electrolytes. There are also um, non-aqueous electrolytes. And electrolyte is just a fancy word for salt water. And so usually you have ions that are in the solution. And the way that we'll balance this charge, right, this negative charge that's moving from the anode to the cathode in the form of an electron is by moving an ion in the electrolyte. And there are two ways to do that, and they're totally equivalent to one another. So the first way is to take a negative charge or an anion and to move it from the cathode to the anode, right? And maybe examples of anions would be like, Cl minus, right? Let's say that you put a sodium chloride in the electrolyte, it would dissolve, right? To give you Na plus or Cl minus. Or in this case, we wrote these as acid reactions, right? They, have, they involve protons. So maybe we have HCl, right? So we have H plus and Cl minus in the electrolyte. Well, if you can move a negative charge from the cathode to the anode, it's actually equivalent to move a positive charge from the anode to the cathode. So those two actions are equivalent and you can design systems that preferentially will move one or the other, okay? And so our electrochemical reactor has really four components, right? It has an anode, a cathode, an electrolyte, and the external circuit. And that's where the electrons either, um, that's where electrons move, either to generate power, in spontaneous work in an electrolytic device, okay? And we can do this for, we didn't want to just consider uh, methane, right? So let's take something that has actually been conceived. So a reactor like this that is able to efficiently convert methane into um, CO2 and power, electrochemically has eluded us so far. So let's do one that's a little bit more successful. Um, let's do oxygen plus hydrogen gives us water, right? And in this case, we can look at the oxidation states again. And so hydrogen is zero here, right? And hydrogen is plus one here. So obviously we've had an oxidation. Oxygen is zero here. And again, it's minus two here. And now our redox reactions are hydrogen oxidation. And maybe this one's a little bit more straightforward that hydrogen goes to two protons plus two electrons. And here oxygen plus again, four protons plus four electrons gives us two waters. And in this particular case, right, this one will happen twice. And we'll get the same overall reaction that we had above. And in that case, right, we would have the hydrogen oxidation reaction occur at the anode. We would have oxygen reduction occur at the cathode. And does anybody know what we would call this, like an actual device that we've engineered, that we've separated the combustion into two, um, into two redox reactions? Anybody? What will we normally call a reactor like this? So you guys may have heard a 
about fuel cells. And there's a bunch of different types of fuel cells. Whether we talk about a proton exchange membrane fuel cell, which we'll look at in a little more detail later. Um, there's molten carbonate fuel cells, phosphoric acid fuel cells, anion exchange membrane fuel cells. Um, and they're all named after the electrolyte and what you choose to use. So in a proton exchange membrane fuel cell, the electrolyte is a polymer that only conducts positive charges. So in that case, this pathway isn't really used and you have protons that move exclusively, exclusively from the anode to the cathode. In an anion exchange membrane fuel cell, it also is a polymer, except it conducts hydroxides from the cathode to the anode. So there are a bunch of different systems and a bunch of different fuel cells um, that have been used to convert the chemical energy in hydrogen and oxygen into directly to electrical energy, okay? So we talked a little bit about the architecture here of an electrochemical device, right? So we have every device is essentially a pair of redox reactions, right? We have an oxidation and a reduction and all of those reactions occur on a surface. And you know, this slide here is one of my do electrochemical systems. And it's very similar. In fact, it's almost weeks ago when we started heterogeneous catalysis. The only difference is that in this version of this slide, right, we explicitly talk about transferring electrons where we didn't do that in the previous form. But all electrochemical processes have the same components that we've talked about in heterogeneous catalysis, that we have mass transfer of some oxidized form from the bulk um, into a diffusion regime, right? Which is the dotted line here. Then you diffuse to the surface, you adsorb, you react, you desorb, diffuse away, and then go back into the bulk. It's exactly the kind of thing that we've been talking about in class over the last couple of weeks. And so that might beg the question, if all electrochemical reactions rely on redox pairs, what types of reactions are available to us? and how are they really useful? Well, here's a couple examples where um, the first type of reaction, at least to me, is an electrodeposition reaction. An electrodeposition, you know, I, and um, plating or electroplating is probably the second biggest market for electrochemical engineers that exists. And you can do electroplating for a number of reasons. It can be for decoration, it can be for corrosion protection. And in an electrodeposition reaction, you basically start with an ion in solution. And then through a reduction process, it is deposited as a solid. And there's a huge amount of literature that's gone into understanding how to do this. And even the device that you're looking at right now relies on electrodeposition, where all of the copper vias, for example, that are in the integrated circuits in your laptop, in your tablet, on your phone, they were all created by electrodeposition. And electrodeposition plays a huge role in, in micro and nano electronics, in addition to some of the things that you see here. So Intel hires a bunch of electrochemical engineers uh, to work there, and specifically on that kind of stuff. So you have electrodeposition reactions. You also have corrosion reactions. And corrosion is almost certainly the largest market for electrochemical engineers. And some of the corrosion is good, or, or um, in the sense that, uh, like the Statue of Liberty, that patina color that's on the Statue of Liberty is all an electrochemical corrosion that's followed then by uh, chemical reactions of intermediates that were formed. And I guess, 
the initial shiny copper statue is probably also beautiful, but I, I, I prefer this version. I really like a patinaed copper. You also can have um, ship corrosion. I show the Titanic here in the bottom of the ocean for an extreme example, but maritime corrosion is a very serious and expensive area. And there is an entire economic system that's built around reducing the corrosion of ships and bridges. And it literally costs humans around the world, hundreds of billions of dollars a year in corrosion. And so corrosion protection and corrosion mitigation is a huge industry. Now, the reactions that we looked at a minute ago, I think of as electrocatalysis. And that's really how that fits into our class this semester, where you either have simple changes in redox states. So I show, let's say, copper two plus to copper one plus or the ferrofair cyanide redox couple. We have these large molecules where you facilitate you know, a single electron transfer or catalysis. And you know, we talked a little bit about a, uh, a fuel cell type reaction or the oxygen reduction reaction before. And we'll get into the architecture, maybe a little bit of a proton exchange membrane fuel cell later. And we'll, we'll um, give you a little bit more detail. You also have chlorine evolution listed here. And I do that because you know, chlorine evolution participates in one of the most important industrial processes in the world, the chloralkali process. And I'll show a diagram of that later as well. And the chloralkali process produces, you know, well over 90% of industrial chlorine in the United States. And so um, that reaction, believe it or not, is extremely important from an industrial perspective. Okay. So hopefully as a, as a brief summary here of some of the components that we've looked at. So the first thing that we talked about was the anode and cathode. And that's where the Faradayic processes that we care about happen. And Faradayic is just a fancy word for electron transfer, right? Or electrochemical reactions. There are also uh, non-Faradayic things that happen. Uh, in fact, all supercapacitors take advantage of non-Faradayic electrochemical processes. And um, you know, supercapacitors are a really interesting um, device, things that have gained a lot of traction the last you know, 20 years or so and something that, um, like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about in my electrochemical engineering class in the fall, if you're interested in that. And we said that the anode and cathode must be electrically conducting uh, to reduce ohmic resistance. So just like wire, uh, electrons moving through a wire, we have to think about the resistance to ions moving through the electrolyte. And so we try usually to make the anode and cathode very close to one another, so that way we can minimize that ohmic resistance. Another way to, in, to decrease ohmic resistance of an electrolyte is to increase concentration, reduce viscosity, all of that kind of stuff. Because remember, the real role of the electrolyte in these reactors is to move charge. Um, it, it is to complete that electrochemical circuit, uh, which allows the cell to completely um, function, right? And to um, to make sure that you maintain charge neutrality, okay? And the need to have ionic conductivity in the electrolyte and electronic conductivity in the electrodes and to have this reactant present leads to something that's called the triple phase boundary. Now, we won't talk about that today. We'll talk about that in the second lecture in this series. So, so sort of remember that word, the triple phase boundary or it's also known as the electrochemically active surface area. We'll come back to that. But you know, one of the questions to answer here is how useful are electrochemical cells or how much work might we be able to extract from, an electro from a galvanic cell or how much work might we have to apply to an electrolytic cell? So let's, let's take a step back for a minute and just do a little bit of thermo and try to answer that question. And we'll start in the exact same place that we've started um, previously this semester, right? We will start with our open system energy balance, which is exactly what we did when we had a flow reactor. And so if we do that, right? So we have, you know, DNU, 
dt is equal to q plus w plus one half times m dot times v in squared minus v out squared plus m dot g times the change in the height plus the sum of enthalpy entering our system from mass flow minus the enthalpy that's leaving because of mass flow, okay? We also have our open system entropy balance that we're going to consider. So we have also DNS DT plus the entropy that is entering or that's leaving our system from mass flow minus the entropy entering because of mass flow minus Q over T surroundings equals the generated entropy, right? And here we're basically looking at the entropy of the system and the entropy of the surroundings, right? Okay, so now we have our open system energy balance and entropy balance and hopefully I guess I didn't say this explicitly a few minutes ago that in a fuel cell or the methane reactor, those would be open systems, right? Because you're flowing hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, you also could do this for closed systems. Uh, so let's say like the an alkaline battery, um, that would be a good example of a closed system. So let's make some assumptions then, okay? So the first thing that we should assume probably is that if we have this open system, that we're operating at steady state, right? That's usually a pretty good one. And we've done that in our class as well. Um, another good assumption is that our system is reversible, right? And I mean that in the thermodynamic context, that the velocity entering is pretty similar to the velocity of the gas that's leaving and also that the change in the height is approximately zero as well. And remember gases have very low density. So for this to really play a role in our energy balance, you either need a dense fluid or huge differences in the height. So we're gonna get rid of those. So how does that change our energy balance and our entropy balance? Well, the first thing that the steady state does is it gets rid of all of the time derivatives, right? And then, the second assumption that it's reversible gets rid of the generated entropy, right? If, a, if something is reversible, there's no generated entropy. And the last two get rid of the kinetic and uh, the kinetic energy part and the potential energy part of the energy balance. And so, what this does is it simplifies both our energy balance and our entropy balance. Now, in our system, remember from the result of this um, steady state energy balance is also that M in is equal to M out, right? That's true, right? At steady state, the, those masses will be the same. So our entropy balance actually simplifies very, very nicely that we get simply that Q equals T times delta S, right? Which is something that we had from, from thermo. And you might think, well, why isn't T surroundings down here? And it's because remember for a reversible process to be possible, the temperature of the system and the temperature of the surroundings needs to be the same. Our energy balance also simplifies quite nicely, right? So this if we wanted to ask the question about work, so I actually can just write this then as work equals minus Q, right? And then plus M dot delta H, okay? And if we look at this, well, this just becomes delta H minus T delta S. And if you remember, Delta H minus T delta S is actually delta G. And so from an electrochemical reactor, the amount of work that we can do is equal to, uh, and sorry, that's minus delta G, minus delta G, okay?
So the best that we can do is delta G of reaction, okay? And actually, I'm sorry, I misspoke. This is delta G, but it's about convention. So when current flows spontaneously, work is done on the system, not the surroundings. And that's where the minus ends up coming from, okay? So that's just to keep a thermodynamic convention. So now, if we look at this, well, how do we convert delta G into something that's a little bit more familiar from an electrical perspective? Well, what are the units of delta G, right? Well, their work. And what are the units of, of work here? Well, they're usually joules per mole. And to think about, that's our chemical definition for work. In electrical engineering, they use something that's a little bit different. They say that work is charge times potential, right? Or equal to Q, not this Q, but actual charge times voltage. And if we wanna think about what charge is and how it's related to our reactants, well, one of the things that we can do is try to break this up a little bit. And if we wanna get this into moles, well, we need to start thinking about something that is like charge per mole of reactant. So if we were to say, to try to get this, right, charge per mole of reactants. Well, how do we do that? Well, all of our reactions above had electrons in them. So what we can do instead is think about this in terms of electrons per mole of reactant. And through Faraday's constant, we know that electrons have charge. So we know, for example, charge per mole of electrons, okay? So if we think about this as moles of electrons per moles of reactant times charge per mole of electrons, well, then that we define actually as something called N, just lowercase n, and this is a known constant from physics. That's Faraday's constant. And so we actually can calculate this, that the work, which was equal to minus delta G, just equals this thing N times Faraday's constant times the voltage. Or um, our cell voltage is equal to minus delta G over NF, right? These are a couple ways that we could look at this, okay? So we've derived an expression for the chemical reactions that we had above to find what the theoretical thermodynamic voltage should be for different devices. And we can apply what we know to a bunch of different devices. So here is one that is the chloralkali reaction, which I talked about before. And a chloralkali reactor actually feeds brine into the cell. And at the anode, you have chlorine oxidation, where Cl minus gives you Cl2 plus two electrons, right? And that's that reaction right here. And you collect the chlorine out the top of the reactor, and you'll transport through a cation exchange membrane, which only allows positive charges through Sodium, so sodium, that positive charge will move charge from the anode to the cathode. And at the cathode, you reduce water to give you hydrogen gas. So hydrogen then gets evolved. So you're co-producing hydrogen and chlorine in this process. And the sodium that came over combines with the hydroxides that are made from the water reduction reaction or hydrogen evolution reaction to give you NaOH. And in fact, one of the byproducts of the chloralkali process is NaOH. So you're actually in this one process producing three different chemicals that are sold commercially. And 
the overall reaction here we could use to calculate what the operating voltage should be, right? So we have in our reactor, right? We have two waters plus Cl minus gives us hydrogen plus Cl2 plus two hydroxides, okay? The other thing I could do if I wanted to actually be able to look up, let's say the, um, well, I guess there's a number of ways to do this, but you also could just also add sodium to both sides and that's two chlorines, right? So I could add two sodiums to each side and also write this as two waters plus two NaCl gives me hydrogen plus chlorine plus two NaOH. And the reason you might do this is that all of those are easily tabulated. So, and you could actually find all of those in your chemistry book. Okay, so what we could do here is we could calculate delta G of this particular reaction, right? And Gibbs, the Gibbs energy of formation here is equal to, or sorry, the standard delta G is the Gibbs energy of formation of hydrogen plus the Gibbs energy of formation for chlorine minus two times the Gibbs energy of formation of water minus two times the Gibbs energy of formation for, uh, for Cl minus. And also, sorry, I forgot, hydroxide. Okay. And as I said, all these are tabulated. So this is zero plus zero minus two times minus 237,000 joules per mole, minus two times minus 131,000 joules per mole, plus two times the Gibbs energy of formation for OH minus, and that's negative 157,000 joules per mole. And so we could find the Gibbs free energy here and that's equal to 400 or is 422,000 joules per mole. And so we could calculate the cell voltage for this, right? So that's equal to minus Delta G over NF, right? Which equals minus 422,000 divided by, well, if we looked at the redox reactions, previously, right? There's two electrons in both of these, right? So that N is equal to two. And Faraday's constant is 96485.3 coulombs per mole of electrons. And that's minus 2.19 volts, okay? And the negative voltage means that it's not spontaneous. So we would actually have to apply at least two volts to this particular reactor to make it work. Now. On the other side, we have, and what I mean by that is spontaneous reactors, we have the proton exchange membrane fuel cell where we have hydrogen, right? Which gave us two protons and two electrons. And the electrons travel through the external circuit. The protons travel through, um, through the cell, through the cation exchange membrane, right? From the anode to the cathode. Now to facilitate this reaction, on both sides, you have carbon supported platinum based catalysts. That's these spheres here on both sides of the membrane, right? The cation exchange membrane in this particular diagram. And one of the things that we could do as well is we could calculate delta G for this reactor. Now, I want to show you. Of course, that reaction gives free energies are also a function of temperature, right? They're not just at the standard condition. So I actually used uh, the NIST chemistry web book to get the, um, to get delta G of formation as a function of temperature. So this is just an Excel file that I put together. If you ever wanted to do this, I use the, en the enthalpy and entropy that's given in the NIST chemistry web book. I use it to calculate delta G. 
and I used it to look at what the cell voltage would be. So the Gibbs free energy here is in blue and it becomes less negative as you increase temperature and you could calculate the theoretical voltage of the cell given that value of delta G. And you can see that for a fuel cell, as you increase temperature, you actually decrease the theoretical voltage or the energy that you could take out of the cell goes down. Now, um, that is balanced because we know that reaction rates become higher. So the kinetics at high temperature are better than the kinetics at low temperature. And we'll talk more about the kinetic side of this, um, uh, the kinetic side of this later on. So I wanna leave you with two things before we end. The first thing is that, you know, we've talked about voltages, okay? Now you could go through the trouble of calculating delta G of reaction for every single reaction that you come across or every single combination of reactions, but this has actually already been done. And we've used the fact that we know that the, the standard thermodynamic voltage is really just the cathode potential minus the anode potential. When we talk more about kinetics next time, we're gonna deal more with potentials than voltages. And what was done was that we defined a standard. So we said that two protons plus two electrons goes to hydrogen gas at unit activity, right? So at one bar, 25 degrees C. We're gonna define this as delta G equals zero. And therefore the potential for that reaction is also defined as zero, point zero volts. And what that has allowed us to do is to then calculate standard potentials for every reaction. And this is just a table of some of those standard potentials. So, we're gonna think about this next time that each electrode has a potential. And we're gonna to try to think about what the potential means for electron transfer and kinetics, okay? And we'll, we'll hopefully what I mean will be a little bit more clear after our second discussion there. And the reason that this is important and the reason potential becomes very important in, in electrochemical systems is that in chemical systems, you often, are just able to do things like increase the temperature and the pressure and you increase the reaction rate. And that's because the electron transfer is itself is coupled. So there's already a local driving force for the reaction to happen. In an electrochemical system, you've decoupled them. So they don't exist next to each other. So there's no short circuit, right? Maybe that's a good way to think about it. And so now if we were to simply increase temperature and pressure, we would just increase the voltage. So how in the world do we make electrons move? Now, we did everything here in terms of thermodynamic potentials. And there's one word that I think of when I think of thermodynamics, and that's equilibrium. Every calculation that we've just done to calculate the voltages assumed, right, that we were at Essentially, at, at equilibrium, the rate of reaction is And in our case, system, that means that no electrons move at equilibrium. Movement of electrons is equal to zero. And that is not useful, right? Remember, power in an electrical system is the current times the voltage. And if the current is equal to zero, you don't generate any power. And that's obviously not a good thing. So we are going to have to provide a driving force to make electrons move. And that's what we're gonna talk about next time.